few months ago, I visited family in the States. It was late June, and it was beautiful sunshine pretty much every day. Now, living in the UK, I know you have to appreciate every bit of sunshine you can get. But I spent an infuriating amount of time stuck in a box. I was stuck in a box for the three miles to my sister's house. I was stuck in a box for the mile and a half to the supermarket. I was stuck in a box for the less than a mile journey to the town center. And that's when it dawned on me just how much I missed getting around by walking and by bike. Because I could see the outside world through glass, but there was no connection. There was no interaction. And lots of us are suffering from the same disconnect, even though we're closer to each other than ever before. 81.5% of us in the UK live in an urban area, according to the 2011 census. Globally, more than half of us live in urban areas. And how we shape those urban spaces matters. Because despite being surrounded by people, four out of five of us report being lonely some of the time. One in 10 report being lonely very often. And two-fifths of older people say that television is their main form of company. Loneliness has a profound impact on our mental health and on our physical health. It has the mortality risk equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And the spaces around us shape the number of social connections we can have. And that's important. A comprehensive review by Nobel Prize winning economists Amartya Sen and Joseph Stiglitz in 2009 showed that social connections have a greater impact on our well-being than any other factor. They also showed that children thrive more and schools fail less in areas where neighbors know each other. But we do know our neighbors less. In 2010, we knew half the number of neighbors as we did in 1982. In addition, our car-led society is le leading to a obesity and inactivity epidemic. In the UK, two-thirds of men and three-quarters of women are not meeting the recommended levels of physical activity. So what's the solution? Right now, I want you to picture an urban setting that encourages connection. Got it? What you're picturing now is most likely a livable space. Maybe you were picturing a busy square or a park. Maybe it was a pedestrianized street with lots of outdoor seating, or a residential road where neighbors actually talk to each other. A livable space is one that has been designed or redesigned for people to connect and interact with each other and with their surroundings. And creating these livable spaces is essential for urban living not just because it addresses a wide range of problems, but because it's what people want. In the UK, among those aged 20 to 29, the rates of those with a full driver's license has been dropping since the mid-90s. One third of that group don't have a license. Among those aged 16 to 19, two thirds don't have a license. And it's not just younger people. The AARP, an organization for retired people in America, have a new livability index where they measure the best cities that they want to recommend. And they do that by looking at mixed-use neighborhoods. So housing and businesses are close. And you can get to the shops. Access to different transport options rather than just the car. And they even look at surveys of how many neighbors people interact with. But that's not a description of most places. Up to 80% of our public open space in cities is the road network. And most streets nowadays aren't places where people meet to trade, 
to gather, to play anymore. Most of that happens behind closed doors or from behind a computer screen. Livable spaces lead to better connected residents. An urban designer named Donald Appleyard studied streets in the 1970s that were the same apart from the amount of traffic that went through them. He looked at which neighbors knew each other, where they met to chat, and how they felt about their local area. In areas of heavy traffic, there are fewer gathering points and far fewer people knew their neighbors. Cars cut the street in two. But even in area, on the same side of the street, you didn't have the same connection. In areas of light traffic, there's a tangle of connections. Neighbors know each other. They have relationships. And as you increase the number of those relationships, you decrease the risk of loneliness and isolation. And creating these livable streets doesn't have to mean bulldozing everything and starting from scratch. And it can happen from right outside your front door. Play streets give residents the chance to close their streets to traffic for a few hours on a regular basis. They have temporary livable spaces. DIY streets gives that power permanently. Residents work with SUSTRANS officers to redesign the street how they want it. Places to gather, to play, or just to cross safely. They look at different options, and then they make one permanent. Livable spaces are essential for this kind of work. Now, Appleyard also found that the areas people feel ownership over increased as traffic decreased. Livable spaces also make us better connected to our local areas. And that's not just true of residential streets. Time after time, studies have shown that after pedestrianization of shopping areas, more people make more trips. They linger longer. Places feel safer. And if you're looking for a direct economic benefit, those who walk and cycle to get there often spend more overall. Jan Gell, a Danish architect, studies these livable spaces, from pedestrianized streets to public squares, by counting the number of people in them and noting what they do. People who stay, who sit, who chat and window shop and meet up with friends use that space to interact. Livable spaces also make us better connected to the local environment. A recent study by the University of Exeter and Hokkaido University showed that people benefit most when they live in cities that have large parks complemented by trees planted along streets and a network of small local green spaces. Now, in addition to being around nature, lower traffic volumes also encourage people to spend more time outside. And the benefits of spending that time outside include increased creativity and memory and reduced stress levels. Livable streets will bring those benefits right to our front doors. Not to mention, by increasing walking and cycling rates, we reduce the risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, anxiety, depression, certain types of cancer, and if we increase the rates of walking and cycling in urban areas, in the UK, it would save the NHS an estimated 17 billion pounds in 20 years. What can we do about it? As individuals, get outside. The more people who use these spaces mean that more people will use these spaces. So walk and cycle in your neighborhoods, use parks, use public squares. Improve the area right outside your front door. Whether that means improving your front garden, putting one pot on a windowsill, or litter picking. And how many of you know the names of the people who live on your street? Get to know your neighbors. You don't have to travel very far. They're your neighbors. <laughs> Figure out what your walking zone is. Pick a comfortable distance for you. 
10, 15, 20, 30 minutes and walk in that radius of your home. What are you missing out on? If you want to get involved as a group, you could set up a street gardening scheme. You could help plant trees. You could have a street party or set up a regular play street. Or you could work with your local government to redesign the street to better suit you and your neighbors. Now, since coming back from the States, I felt so much more appreciative of the connections that I have. I, I <laughs> cycle into work. And I nod at the same car mechanic every single morning. On the way home, if I pass by a friend, I can stop and have a chat with them and catch up. I know my neighborhood more. I have more connection with that. I know where there's apple trees. I talk to my neighbors. I pick up rubbish when I'm walking. And I even can hear birdsong, all without being stuck in a box. Thank you.